Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Jennifer Caniglio with CCBJ. We are thrilled to be working with our partner, H5, to present today's webcast, Everything Personal, AI and Privacy. Our distinguished speakers are Jen Beckage, Managing Director of Beckage, Nina Jenkins, uh, sorry, Nia Jenkins, Senior Associate General Counsel, Data Technology, Digital Health and Cybersecurity for Optum, which is United Health Group, Kimberly Pack, Associate General Counsel Compliance for Anheuser-Busch, Eric Pender, Engagement Manager for H5, and Sheila Mackey, Managing Director, Corporate Segment H5. We encourage everybody to ask questions as well as fill out the survey with your feedback at the end. If you're interested in the presentation and any of the other fantastic resources available, you may download them all using the icons at the bottom of your screen. Today's webcast is CLE and CPE eligible. Be sure to answer all the pop-up check-ins and enter your state bar number in the survey. All states will be applied for after the webcast and certificates will be distributed once the state approves. CLE credit is only available for the live day and not on demand. If you require CPE, please be sure to request a certificate of attendance in the survey. And now after all that, let me pass it off to Sheila. Sheila? Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheila Mackey, and I'll be the moderator today. Thank you for joining this webinar on everything personal, AI, and privacy. I want to start by thanking today's panel. We appreciate their time and willingness to share their expertise. As a reminder, opinions are those of the speakers and not their employers. Everyone working within and around corporate, the corporate space is aware of the privacy risk companies as well uh, <laughs> companies are facing, as well as the growing regulatory imperatives that aim to give people control of their personal information. By now, we know about GDPR in the EU and CCPA here in California, and other states are following, like New York and Virginia, and they're adding privacy regulations, and certainly there are more to follow. Only time will tell if there will be a federal privacy regulation to eliminate a patchwork of individual state regulations and create common definitions or key terms and concepts. While we're grappling with these privacy issues, the use of AI, which can be either artificial intelligence or augmented, augmented intelligence and other technology is evolving, driving new and different privacy concerns. It's no longer simple a risk that your social security number may be exposed. It's morphed into how your data may be subjected to algorithms that expose everything from health issues to political views, from purchasing preferences to your credit scores. With that backdrop, today we will discuss privacy issues that our panelists are facing as they grapple with exploding data volumes, increasing regulations, and evolving technologies. So let's get started. Nia, Starting with you, what are your strategies for tackling what Gartner calls the volume, variety, and velocity of data as it relates to privacy? So I'm just looking at the, the volume, kind of the, the big fives around big data. Um, the way that we tackle it is just kind of looking internally within our organization and thinking about how can we use cross-functional teams. With that, we pull together our privacy organization, data governance, which I'm a part of, also compliance, security, and then also at times um, we, we have other SMEs who might be a part of that team. And the importance of that group is to really have much more of a line of sight into the data that's coming in and going out of the organization. Another way that we approach it is thinking about a data repository. You know, oftentimes you hear the term data lake. And so that's an area that we have actually built internally a system to really track what type of data we have, where is this data coming from, who's a main point of contact for that data, and also kind of other parameters or guidelines around that type of data that we should be cognizant of. Uh, and then we also have an infrastructure where people are able to reach out to us to request access to certain data pools. And with that team, we're able to think through, is it appropriate to let that team use the data for their intended purpose or use? Okay, wow. Kimberly, building on that, um, talking about the convergence of teams and technology, do you have defined workflows that you're employing that work around with the technology? Yeah, we do. Um, and full disclosure, they're getting better every day. So I want to say I joined the company 
about seven months ago, we we're building out our privacy function. So for those in the audience that are still early in the journey, even though we're a large company, um, you know, having a formalized team that's really dedicated to this stuff is new for us. Um, and so we do have some defined workflows, but I think, you know, to Nia's point, like for me, really having clarity about how business gets done, um, well, who's using the data, how they're using it. Some rogue pl employees do things independently. Um, and, you know, we do also use a working group where we, the same kind of people that Nia um, alluded to, we also have um, our tech team, which we call Solutions, um, the folks who own data, uh, the customer service group that kind of is the front gate for um, some of our data subject requests, just making sure that we all come together. We're doing that on a bi-monthly basis. So, and this again for visibility, awareness, to have consistency and approach to problems that come up and issues. Um, and for me, one of the big goals is to move from just having privacy activities to actually running a robust privacy program. Okay. Uh, Jen, what has been your experience in when counseling your clients on data privacy issues? Yeah, I mean, just to kind of echo what's already been said, I mean, the whole life cycle, right? All stages, there's privacy issues are going to come up. Um, security issues are going to come up. So uh, let's innovate, let's do it, but we need a plan. And it's supposed to be an exciting time. So coming up with that right team, which was already discussed, compliance, privacy, legal, infosec, um, customer service and other teams that might be impacted, focus groups if we need them um, regarding the outputs and the user interfaces and the results and what we're going to be using them for. Um, there's a lot of different, depending on the size of the organization and the stage you're at, different people that can be involved. Um, and then answering those questions that were discussed. If we're collecting information, do we know what we're collecting, where it's coming from? If we've collected ourselves, are we providing the right notice? Are we complying with the right laws um, and standards? Um, what's the quality of that input? Uh, as we know, you know, that garbage in, garbage out, right? So we wanna make sure we're, we're getting that right data. It's clean. We know that it um, has good integrity, the origin of it, if we need to go back, um, or if a data subject a request makes a request concerning that information. Um, other things that have already been mentioned, like data retention, cybersecurity, um, intellectual property at Backage, our intellectual property team works with artificial um, intelligence issues. And I know uh, there's even court cases regarding um, patent applications where uh, machines are named as the inventor. I mean, so all of these are new sort of issues that are being um, wrestled with uh, and all topics that organizations um, should should uh, address when they're putting together a program to adopt AI and use AI in their organization. That's certainly, uh, but all of you have alluded to a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. So Kimberly, with all of the changes in this landscape, how do you and your teams keep up internally? So for me personally, I find that, you know, the, the biggest thing for me, or well, the most useful thing for me is, you know, following the things that the law firms are doing because they're fresh. Uh, they are concurrent as things are happening. You know, some law gets introduced. They put out something two days later, so that's super helpful. Um, I'm also a member of IAPP. Uh, I also participate and follow the work of the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, I, our teams, our external affairs teams are helpful. You know, they're active and, you know, the different legislators, so they see things that's coming through. They sit on committee members, uh, committee or business forums or, you know, that's discussing laws and, you know, are able to report back some of the things that our peer groups are talking about in those sessions. Um, I personally use LinkedIn, right? I follow a lot of privacy people because they are also tracking things, following things, um, and I get to see it because I personally cannot stay on top of it. It's too much, too many things are moving and happening every day. You know, some laws, you know, comes up, some amendment happens, some law dies, it comes back, you know, and so there's a lot of moving parts this year particularly. Um, and so for my teams, I, I give training. And so so the way they keep up is as I learn things, um, we set up trainings that's for specific groups. We do, we find it helpful to make it really practical for each group. So I'll have one for the HR team because they have certain things that they're responsible for that we can just really tailor. I tailor for the procurement teams because they are a really essential partner. Um, as you think about them and their interactions with vendors and contracts, especially if you happen to be a company that legal only reviews at a certain threshold, 
even if it's not a big dollar amount, that contract could still be with a vendor that has some privacy concerns, some privacy overlap. And so we need to make sure that that is being reviewed appropriately. So procurement is really big there. And then my biggest risk group are my marketing teams. And so we have a lot of things for them um, because they are very anxious and uh, innovative and creative um, and finding new things that they want to do and want to use, and it all centers around data. So that's kind of how we I keep up for myself and then really cascade that information, really try to tailor the training so that it makes sense for people, um, and also try to have like tools and infographics so people can use it, pass it along, and then record all your trainings because everyone's not going to show up. <laughs> well, that was a, a, quite a list, Kimberly. Mia, anything you have to add to that list? Uh, not much at all. Um, you, you cover so much. Uh, and the, the only piece that I think might be helpful that I know comes up a lot when you think about regulations and things that are changing is that top of mind for many leadership or leaders within our organizations is really how much of our data is impacted. You know, are we going to now have to do something because of the change of these regulations? So it gets back to kind of what we were just discussing, which is having line of sight into the types of data you actually have so that as regs are changing, you're able to say, well, do we have many customers do we have in California, for example? You know, those are the kinds of things that then start to become really important as you think about how are we going to now operationalize under the new regulation? Right, and I alluded to in the intro that just this patchwork we could end up with if we don't have a federal, something like GDPR that covers the EU or the EEA. So Jen, when you're talking to clients, I'm curious, has the new, the change in administration come up and what could potentially come out of that um, related to privacy as well as privacy in, in all countries outside the US? Sure. Yeah. I mean, definitely with the new administration in the United States, we'll probably see more enforcement um, opportunities uh, as it relates to new technologies. We're already seeing that. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think we want to try to avoid a repeat of what happened with data security laws. So remember, there's data security and data privacy. And data privacy is really about protecting, um, or sorry, about individuals asserting rights um, to their information. You know, they want to be left alone. They want to tell you how they're going to use their information. Data security is about protecting that data from unauthorized access. And historically, um, when all the states started to coming up, came up with their own data breach laws, right? We have all, every state has their own data breach law. And it's, you know, when you're complying with uh, data breach notifications, um, as our law firm does, you know, you have to look at the different laws that be um, that it may be impacted, and it's sort of this patchwork. Um, and, and now on the privacy side, we're starting to see that, right? We have CCPA um, as a California privacy law, we have Virginia, and we know multiple other states have pending legislation. So um, will there be a federal privacy law? Um, there is tremendous push for that, and we might see one you know, sooner um, than later in light of everything that's sort of going on in the world today. I think that's true. So um, there's definitely a proliferation of data. We talked about that and, and the acceleration of innovation around that and augmented or artificial intelligence is it's definitely a, a hot topic the last year or so. Um, so Kimberly, how is your company using AI at this point? Or are you, I should say? So we are using some, and so um, I, I gave thought to this. So a few that we are adopting or are currently exploring, I'll share a few use cases um, in the HR space. Um, as you know, people are continuing to look for good talent and wade through all the information out there. Um, that is an area where we are using um, IA, but there where, you know, what I'm really concerned about is making sure that there's not this automatic decision-making that's taking place, making sure that there is no mandatory um, effects, unintended discriminatory effects. So it's really limited in how we're using it, but it's still helpful in being able to identify some target candidates that maybe we wouldn't be able to identify before. Um, the marketing team, of course, as there's so much information out there, the desire to use third-party data from these different vendors um, as they continue to get insights to be able to bring personalization um, and to really tailor folks' experiences. So that's one area. Um, and there, you know, I'm really thinking about, you know, questioning my third parties, making sure I understand how the data, you know, what the data is, how to get it, making sure consent's there, make sure we have the right contract terms in place and make sure that, you know, they are stating what they're doing and that indemnifying us to the extent that, you know, that's relevant. Um, and then even a privacy space. And I think we'll get to 
this later, but I'll use the juice case now, um, and being able to know where our data is, right? So we've been really making a concerted effort to get everyone onto this great suite of enterprise tools, but that wasn't always the case. And some people, you know, may still be a little rogue. And so just kind of being able to see where it is, use machine learning that's smart and can identify things, it can flag things as personal information so that we can know where they are in, in anticipation of being more responsive and accurate to any data subject requests. Um, another area, which is a little odd, is not so much personal information, but there's images. So we are using a tool for training where our employees are videoing themselves doing something. So the know-how of how to do it. And then the, the software is creating automatic SOPs, finding efficiencies um, and things like that. So I thought that was kind of neat. So that's something that we just started doing recently. Um, but again, their images are there, making sure that we have the right um, releases, you know, so people can't say, I don't want to use it when they get mad, right? So, because we're spending lots of money to create this week of training tools. Um, so that's another use case that I thought would be nice to mention here. So Kimberly, it doesn't sound like there's been much resistance to adoption of AI. Well, I mean, I there can be re resistance. There has to be assistance in doing things the right way. And so that's where, you know, this privacy team comes in um, to the extent that, you know, because IA is just a tool, right? It's not good. It's not bad. And so the thing is, it's like, what are we using it? How are we going to use it? How we get the data? So that's what's really important. So I'm absolutely not resistant. So when the teams have things that they want to do, um, you know, they go through our PIA process, you know, and we're able to do a full assessment and get comfort um, for most of the things that they want to do. So things that we can't do, we can't do it, or places where we really have to have a lot of limitations or restrictions on it, um, and then really have really good controls to make sure that we are using it in a way that, you know, ethically complies with the way we want to use data for, either, for our employees and our consumers. Okay. So Nia, um, being in the healthcare field, I'm guessing it, it might be a little bit different. So what has been your experience with um, bringing AI into the organization, adoption, implementation? So definitely one way where we are thinking about AI and its use within our organization is around new product development. Um, you know, our, our focus is making healthcare better, more efficient, um, and also trying to keep our customers, patients at top of mind. And AI is definitely a way to do that. Um, but one major thing to always think about and that we as an organization are constantly kind of um, educating ourselves and improving on is the intersection of AI with uh, bias. And so, you know, it's thinking about the data itself, the quality of the data, the patient population that we're working with, and being mindful about the data as it comes in, what is the value and is there an impact based upon the patient population and certain discriminatory kind of um, information that might we may be taking in. And so, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier is that, you know, data is, is really only as useful as the type of data and quality of data that you have. And so we have really implored a lot of uh, research and um, we have also really thought about, you know, expanding our technologies, our teams and practices in terms of thinking about our coding, about how our AI is informed, and really trying to be transparent and, and model against some of that information and how it's informing what we do. Okay, um, Nia, do you, do you feel there's a risk from a competitive advantage for companies not adopting AI at this point? I definitely think so. I mean, the reality is, is that we, we're in a world where I think, you know, customers um, and, and just kind of the community is really expecting and demanding um, a lot of information very quickly. They want tools that are very useful, that are intuitive. And I think that if you think about any of your uses of, of technologies today, they really use so much AI and it, it's a lot of comfort in that and knowing what you want and, and where you want to go. And because of that, I think if you're not thinking about it as an organization, it is very unlikely that your customer population will be as satisfied with your product as posed against another product. Kimberly, would you agree that's true for your sector as well? Yes, I mean, AI is a useful tool, right? It helps us do things more efficiently. 
um, better. Sometimes, it, like, again, in the privacy space, it's going to help me be more accurate. And so being able to um, adopt it, and again, to the points that we've already said, in the right way, I think is really what's critical and not avoiding it because you won't be competitive um, and you won't you won't be providing your business and your your consumers the best you know version of your services and products if you're not taking advantage of some of this technology that's out there. Okay, uh, Jen, uh, we have a question that's come in and I, I want to slot it in because it's something that you were talking to in the last segment. So the question is, do you anticipate that other states will follow California in introducing something similar to CCPA? So we mentioned that um, New York and Virginia are following. Jen, do you have any insights on that that you can share? Yeah, I mean, we're already there, California and Virginia. Um, there's more states that have pending legislation. So yes, this is coming. It's been coming for a while. Um, and the only sort of um, thing that could change all this is if we have a federal privacy law, perhaps. Um, there still may be individual state laws that address gaps in other areas, um, you know, preemption obviously is going to become an issue. There's, there's still a lot of things to be worked out on that side. But yes, there are more states that are adopting these laws. Um, and there is, you know, it, it's anticipated that um, efforts to pass a federal privacy law will go much faster under this current administration. So, you know, our law firm is working with clients who are, you know, look, they're international brands. So they're facing these privacy laws in other jurisdictions. And now, you know, if they have you know, dealing with um, California data, now we're dealing with that. Um, working together to put, put together those programs and compliance um, packages so that, you know, if we do see more of these laws are not playing whack-a-mole with it, um, we can use the fundamental pr principles underlying like privacy and security to really come up with a robust program um, so that, again, you're not playing with a, a patchwork of laws. Okay. And, and back to the comments that Nia and Kimberly just made, when it comes to the intersection of privacy and AI, Jen, what do you see as the benefits as well as the risks? Yeah. I mean, look, I am a technologist at heart. I used to own and run technology companies before I was a lawyer. Um, we used to build technologies that were brand new that didn't exist, you know, six months prior. Um, and I know this feeling of that the law, the community, the maybe the vendors, everyone really hasn't caught up um, and, and having to educate and explain it. So I love that, you know, some of the panelists have already mentioned um, training. But, you know, so from that perspective, you know, I love it. I think it's great to innovate. And that's always going to happen. The laws and guidance, you know, just may not catch up and there might be some mis misinformation out there. But if you can adopt this and, and this isn't new. I, you know, when we talk about AI, AI, there's AI, there's lots of different technologies under it, right? There's robotics, there's machine learning, there's natural language processing. There's a lot of different types. So um, if you can identify what you're going to use, it can be a tremendous opportunity uh, to innovate, um, make more money, go into new markets, have a competitive advantage. And we've seen that time and time and time again with our um, clients. But with anything like hiring an employee or installing a new system, you know, with all of those benefits, you know, you still have to do that risk analysis. Um, I just spoke on 5G applications this morning and I said the same thing. No matter what it is, we need to do that risk analysis with trusted advisors that know the space to talk about the legal, the technical and other issues. Um, AI may have risks. It, it may not. It depends on what you're using it for and how you're using it. So you have to look at your company and what applies and what practices you have and what data you're ingesting. Is it consumer data? Then maybe we got to think about things like the GDPR and soon the uh, CIPRA um, in California. Um, where is it coming from? Under what contract? Any restrictions? Uh, there's just so many things that you sort of have to think about, you know, and how you're sharing it and do you have contracts for that. And then we already touched upon unintended consequences. You know, will there be some sort of bias or discrimination? Uh, we already have a number of um, attempts, if you will, at, at laws and, uh, and opinions around this. Um, we see some state laws that are popping up that will definitely have some impact on this as well. Um, and then just making sure that your tool works, right? So that, you know, if you want the benefit of it working, you need to make sure it's working. 
So audits and reviews to test reliability, um, avoid unintended consequences. You have integrity in your data. You're avoiding cyber risks. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, but it's not impossible. This is not the first time it's been done. And there are um, a lot of things um, already available and out there that you can use um, to get started. You just got to take that first step by assembling the right team and coming up with a plan. Okay, sticking with that sort of balance of, of benefit and risk, uh, Kimberly, when, when you think of legal and privacy and risk and e-discovery and all of those parts of, of your role, um, what, are the, what are the benefits you're seeing so far by leveraging AI and other advanced technologies? Yeah, I mean, again, so the tool that's been most helpful for me is um, this adopting a tool that allows me to see what's out there and where it is and being able to um, correct, you know, data from being somewhere where it shouldn't be and those kinds of things that helps me. Um, I, I don't say what helps me sleep at night because I've committed to not letting work keep me up at night, but it helps me feel better <laughs> about my job and what we're doing and how the company is doing with that. And even though it's not perfect, it just gives us a better picture of where it is and where the gaps might be and where how do we close some of those gaps. Um, I think there's some usage with, you know, for legal hold purposes and things like that. And so it's, it's, it's helpful um, and it's evolving. And you know, the way we're using it today, as it continues to learn, it will only, my, our expectation is that it will get even better, right? And so I'm looking forward to, because once you start, like it's, they, a lot of the technology is, it's a learning and it, it will get, you know, understand your business better, the type of documents and the kind of information you work with. And so, you know, with IA, the sooner you start using it, you know, you get better results over time. And so I'm happy that we're taking those steps now. Um, and looking towards a future where we continue to use it ethically, but it also helps us to be more efficient and to um, make decisions faster and be more accurate. Okay, Nia, has your experience been similar? Yes, it's definitely been similar. Just thinking about, you know, in legal and in the use of AI, it's just oftentimes, how can we be more efficient? The reality is, is that many of us in our roles within our organizations as a part of legal, you know, you are asked to do a lot with a little. And so having AI capabilities to do things such as search your contracts for expiration dates so that you can get the business team ahead in terms of time and thinking about a renewal, um, being able to utilize AI for no touch agreements. So having some um, lower risk agreements going through the process where maybe your legal team is having to do less um, than uh, oftentimes other contracts that maybe you have in place. And so, you know, those are ways that I see AI is really helping us streamline and become more efficient and really operate kind of top of license. So we have our people doing the most strategic and kind of thoughtful work possible. And, and I think that that really makes a stronger legal team and, and it really provides for much more of a, a happier team who's able to really get more fulfilled with the work that they do. Okay, and Eric, uh, getting you into the conversation, as a provider of some of these solutions, what are some of the, the common use cases that you see clients concerned about specifically related to addressing privacy? Yeah, I, I tend to think of these really in two different buckets. The first is situations where technology is being used to track information about the data. And in the privacy space, I think we tend to see that with your data maps, your privacy impact assessments, maybe what you're doing around vendor management. And I think most companies that, that I've worked it, with are actively managing their privacy risks uh, and they're doing those activities. The second situation is where technology is being used to take some specific action on the data. And I think it's this second bucket where I'm really seeing AI and some of the advanced technologies are coming into play more and more. Uh, and there's three big use cases that I see there. Um, it tends to be around breach response, uh, production slash privilege review, and then trying to identify PII in those data sets, and then defensible disposal. So with a breach response, obviously you have really fast timelines. You're trying to determine what was breached, what personal information in that data set, um, you know, what was contained in that data set. And then you're working to compile your log to begin notifying your data subjects um, that they were subject to a breach. Um, I think in that case, right, there's this need to really zoom into the data 
and to be very granular about what information is there. Um, and then you have production and privilege reviews. The timelines aren't quite as fast, but you know, still PII review takes a long time. It seems like it takes a long time no matter what. Um, and I think you run into overcapture and undercapture issues or historically have with, with, with you know, past technology. Um, redaction tends to be sort of the bigger focus there. Um, and on the very proactive side, I'm seeing more and more companies who are thinking about defensible disposal. They're thinking about how can I uh, head off some of these issues further left on the EDRM and, and really more from an information governance strategy. And as opposed to breach, I think the need here is to actually to zoom out from the data and see where your concentrated pockets of sensitive data really live within uh, the organization. Okay, a question just came in and it kind of follows on this and I don't know who to <laughs> to direct it to, so I'm gonna let you guys have a free for all on it, but it says, can AI be used by an individual to discover what is on the dark web that is personal private data? Um, these technology and AI methods seem to be used by security companies who require you to pay uh, for learning what may be on the dark web. Anyone have Anything to to um, to share there? I, I can add to it. I handle a lot of data security issues, um, and uh, a lot of breaches. Our our firm is a, um, an authorized breach coach, um, and myself um, practice in that space quite a bit. Um, and I'll say that. AI can do anything, right? I mean, if you really wanted to identify a technology um, to leverage, let's say machine learning in that instance or um, some other sort of aspect of it, you know, you could. Um, I won't speak to any individual tools, but I'll say that, you know, generally, um, scripts and algor algorithms can be written to take certain data sets and, and you know, do different things with it, right? Maybe add it with more data sets, eliminate certain things, synthesize data, um, and that may lead to a result that will be consumable by you and your example of searching the dark web, but could be on anything. So, I mean, I think the short answer is um, AI could do anything. I'm sure there's many companies that are deploying AI technologies. I know some um, that are um, and more to come. So it, it's not that you know, AI is the only way to do certain things. It's the fact that it, it helps speed things up and make it makes it more efficient um, and provides, you know, quicker, faster intelligence. So um, I hope that answers the question. If not, I'm sure the question person who asked it will follow up. Anyone else have anything to add to that uh, audience question? Okay, so Jen, um, going back to... Oh, sorry. On the security side, I, I think we have a dedicated security team that does things like that um, on occasion, um, especially if, you know, some third party had a breach or something. Again, it's not perfect because the dark web is like mysterious, right? So it's no perfect like, yes, I scraped the dark web and we're clear, but um, <laughs> just something helpful to know and to try to assess, you know, uh, you know, shallow level kind of things about like where things might be. Um, and things like that. So we do have some uses for that. Yeah, and it's okay. good to hear there's a team, right? Because no matter what decisions you're gonna make around AI, you really have to do it as a team um, and work with legal and IT and compliance and privacy and security and all those sorts of things because just there's this sort of saying and you know, security and privacy, you know, just because we can, should we? Um, and just because we can search the dark web and we can do that as mentioned, I mean, there's a ton of false positives out there, right? There's lots of passwords that are out there from old breaches that all of us have changed our passwords from then. So you have to be able to weed through that data in a smart way. So I think, you know, we keep saying you've got to have that right sort of team of trusted advisors that really, really, really know the space because there's a lot of moving parts. Okay. So we, we took a little detour to answer that question. Um, so Jen, back to what Eric had shared. Did, I wanted to just see if you had any uh, points you wanted to make after Eric's. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that he did a great job summarizing, you know, kind of the point of view to, to look at it. Um, 
And, you know, looking at you know, record retention and destruction is obviously important, including any ethical obligations you might have around the data. For example, as lawyers on the phone, there's some ethical rules um, that we need to keep in mind when we're using new technologies, um, our duty of competence rule, depending on where you're admitted. Um, and, and courts are just starting to see um, and take more active roles in this and kind of asking questions, you know, so what are cookies? And someone's tracking this phone call and this video call. So we're, we're starting to see more more, more inquiries um, into that as well. Um, but no, nothing else to add. It was a very nice summary. Okay. So I think everyone, all of you have touched on this, uh, having this needing to understand where data is, where it's going, um, you know, proactively protecting privacy and other sensitive information, identifying, classifying it. So Eric, in order to protect data, under you know the regulations that we've all been talking about, um, companies need to be able to find it. So, what are some of the ways to identify and classify data in order to to do whatever after, whether it's secure it, whatever the case may be? What are what are some of those? Yeah, you know, I think when it comes to privacy, every company is going to have different goals as it relates to sort of the, their level of maturity in terms of what they're trying to achieve with their privacy programs, and some companies are going to be trying to achieve a higher level of maturity and other companies will have a lower level of maturity they're trying to reach because that's what makes sense for their business. I think in my experience, how companies are using technology to assist in their privacy programs, I mentioned earlier, I think most that I've seen are using technology to track information about their data. I think where we're really gonna see a focus in the coming years and uh, advancement in program maturity is around using technology to take action on the data. And there's really two ways that I think technology is improving data privacy workflows, and that's around data enrichment and data extraction. On the data enrichment side, technology is really looking into your document corpus to identify and, and to classify PII that exists. So as an example, taking a look, here's a document and identifying that it has a social security number in it. It has a date of birth in it. And the technology now is able to count the number of instances of each of those pieces of PII. So I think it's really interesting to be able to look and say, all right, here's an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV that has 450 social security numbers in it, as opposed to here's an email that only has one social security number in it. And to be able to sort of quantify that is really powerful. And I think that information really allows us to zoom out from the data. You can prioritize your actions with that data, determine what needs to be reviewed first, what's your biggest risk, what you need to delete. So it becomes really actionable in that way. And then on the data extraction side, that really harvests the actual pieces of PII that exist in the data. So it's not just saying this doc contains a social security number, but specifically, this is the social security number. And I think that really helps us on uh, the, the zoom in aspect, allowing companies to build out these profiles of data subjects and breach subjects to compile the notification log. It's all about sort of building those connections, that profile within the technology that is smart enough to say, hey, you've told me this social security number belongs to this to this person. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna go through and make that connection for every instance in your document corpus where that social security number appears, right? To, to really you know, expound on that social security number and make all those connections in the corpus. I think that's super, super powerful. And I think there's so many benefits to this data extraction and, and data enrichment sort of framework, it allows you to prioritize review, it allows for a faster understanding of personal data and what is subject to a data breach. Uh, I think it makes your, your workflows more efficient. But then I think there's, there's even further benefits that aren't always immediately apparent. I think it's a great backstop for consent management or DSAR deletion requests to confirm whether you're complying with a do not sell request that allows you to go through your document corpuses and your data to really uh, identify whether you've, you've gotten rid of the data that you needed to. I think for third parties and vendor management, whether you're receiving data or sending data to third parties to conduct some audit compliance 
I think there's big implications even for how companies and privacy departments calculate risk. Once you're able to quantify how much of this information exists, um, do you maybe use that information to determine the lever levels of coverage from an insurance standpoint that maybe you need for a potential data breach? Um, and I think there's also interesting implications for defensible disposal, especially when we talk about unstructured data. So I think there's a lot of benefits um, that this, this uh, sort of technology can bring to the table. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Nia, when listening to Eric um, and thinking about your situation, are there workflows or processes that you're using to identify data in order to categorize it or secure it? Yeah, so um, two things come to mind. Um, one, I would say very similar to what Eric just presented, you know, utilizing technology to help capture data that's being sent or received. Um, also, if you have employees who are storing whatever type of data on their computer, even if it's their own data, being able to actually signal that and reach out to the employee through even an automated process to better understand why is that data there. But the second piece is also in terms of identification is your people are an asset for identification as well. And what I mean by that is, you know, you within your organization can usually identify who are your biggest kind of consumers, whether it be it recipients or those who are actually then um, sending out data and really targeting those particular business teams and groups and utilizing that as an opportunity to educate and train. And with that, you know, you're able to better capture the data that's coming in or out, have that team be more proactive in reaching out to you and including you in on that conversation. And then also working with, as we mentioned, that cross-functional team, they are going to be the best advocates of utilizing data in the right way, but also will be the eyes and ears for a line of sight into the data that you have within your organization. Okay, and Kimberly, you've, you've talked already about um, an enterprise tool that you use to identify data. Um, I, I do wanna, I'm curious if that tool also categorizes it for you, but we did have a question that came in that I wanna circle back. It's, it's sort of on the same topic, but it says Kimberly mentioned her PIA. Can you elaborate on that? The privacy impact assessment. So we deploy that for any new technology or new use cases of personal data. And so people have to submit that. We use a tool, again, we're not naming any companies at this panel, so, but yeah, so we right. use a tool um, for those things are kicked off and it's a workflow for us to be really clear about the use, um, how it's being used, who the vendor is, if it's a third party vendor, uh, what kind of information be collected. So we have that. And then on the back end, it also helps with some data mapping too, because it's also connected. Um, so that's also very helpful for us. Do you use the same tools, Kimberly, um, in the U.S. as you do for any cross-border? So um, thankfully, um, I am only responsible for the U.S., so the way our company is set up, it's in zones, and so I'm zone U.S., which is uh, enough stuff to think about. Um, but we do use some of the same tools, um, and they are just really walled off to be very specific because, you know, Europe has different regulations than we do. Um, and so the data is set up differently. The way it's categorized is different. We're an alcohol beverage company, even the legal age is different, right? So we're 21, other places is 18. So we just have a lot of things that are unique to our, um, to our uh, jurisdictions. Um, but yeah, so we, we try to use some of the same tools for, you know, scalability and for us to kind of know globally as a, as a company, you know, where our data is, how it's being used. And so we, they've been making conservative efforts to try to um, condense what tools we're using um, so that we can, as a global company, they could have that kind of oversight and insight into what we actually have, which is also very important, right? So we're not, the U.S. is, is not just by itself, right? If something really big happened here, it would have an impact um, on the entire company, you know, overall. So that's that's our approach. Okay. And uh, another question came in that's sort of on, the, you just said that you're U.S. focused, but, you know, obviously you're a global company, as is um, Optum. So uh, the question was, can you speak to the international aspect of your data privacy? How are you, how are your companies handling the various GDPR or GDPR-like laws around the world? I mean, we often talk about GDPR, but APAC has laws. I mean, China has some of their own specific laws. Latin America has laws. So how, how are you dealing with that internally? Um, 
I, I'll send that to you, Kimberly, but knowing you're somewhat U.S. centric, but then sure. Mia can weigh in and then, of course, uh, Jen for her clients. Yeah, so I think one of the things that we do is try to do things similarly. So, for example, we our digital ethics policy is a global policy. It's principles based. Um, and us being principles based, you know, some of it admittedly is probably GDPR ish, right? So data minimization and accountability and things like that. And so I think our goal is for us to act similarly wherever we can. So, you know, so there's not this big difference in how we're using data, but to the extent that certain things are, you know, legally viable in a different jurisdiction, that might be where we may have some divergence. But the goal is for us to have the same ethics ethical um, approaches to data as a global company and not bifurcate that. Um, and again, that is principle based because ultimately laws come and go, they change, but you really need to have a sense of what your standards are. How do you want to approach it? What's that messaging like, you know, cause trust is a big deal for any brand, right? And so being able to be trustworthy and have uh, a, a, an approach that is really thoughtful about either your employees who are important to you and your consumer data, which is also very important, we think is important for us and can continue to be our, you know, competitive advantages as we try to be, you know, the best their company in the world. Okay. So that's a plug yeah. for Anheuser-Busch there, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mia, any, uh, anything you want to add to that? Or, or yeah. is there anything different in, in your perspective? So I think that there is definitely a lot of similarities, you know, when you can have overlap, you know, you, you want to do that. But I think it kind of goes back to this idea of really knowing what data you have and trying your best to um, capture that um, in some way, shape or form. And when you're able to segment certain types of data off based upon where it's coming from, et cetera, it then allows you to then manipulate or uh, in terms of what data is released, how you are um, actually storing the data, if you have to return the data to you know, the actual um, owner of the data. And so those are things that are unique based upon jurisdiction and you need to have flexibility within your infrastructure and how you store that data to be able to act upon those regulations. So that, that's something else I would just mention. Okay, Jen, anything to add from outside counsel standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I just echo what everyone else has said. And yes, the you know the laws um, and are really based on these same principles, right? So, and that's why putting an overarching program together is is really beneficial. So you're not playing whack-a-mole every time there is a new law. Um, so I definitely agree with that. And you know these these concepts about um, you know do I need to do an impact assessment? Do I need to have a privacy officer? Does privacy by design apply to me? All those sorts of things. You know, we often see organizations that have spent a lot of money with um, maybe a tech company or someone that's dabbling in the space, and they're off complying with a law that actually doesn't apply to them. Um, and if you're going to do that in the U.S., know that if you make you know forward-facing disclosures about that, the FTC said that if you say you're going to comply with the GDPR, publicly facing, then we're going to hold you to the GDPR, right? Um, because we don't want deception and misrepresentations and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, really taking that measure twice, cut once approach is very, very important. Um, understanding that this data, um, you know, technology, laws, all of it is changing and evolving fast. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to have a policy that sort of stands the test of time, a program that stands the test of time. Um, and it's not just the international, right, GDPR um, and many other laws from other countries, but also on the, the U.S. side, um, you know, things like proposed legislation that, um, you know, was uh, considered that really focused on more AI driven technologies and requiring impact assessments and things like that. So you're going to have to balance all these kind of different laws together um, and, and then put a plan to, together and, and start putting it in place. Eric, do you have anything you want to add there? And, and I, I, I will ask, because I was curious about your previous comment, uh, focus more on, you know, data birth, social security numbers. But what about when you're trying to identify PII that's not so basic? where you're not trying to match a pattern. Do you have anything you want to add there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're really starting to see technology that's becoming a lot more advanced in its capability to identify those things. And whether it's using AI, what we think of as AI, whether it's using linguistic modeling, natural language processing, uh, technology that's really becoming more advanced on looking at the context 
around potential pieces of PII to understand better, not only from a pattern matching perspective, which you know you can be fairly confident about uh, in certain cases, um, to say he, here's here's some documents that we think maybe have PII in them, and and the context of the document is leading us to believe that, leading the machine to believe that, surfacing those as well. And so I think we're starting to see uh, a, a a honing in from the overbreadth and underbreadth. Uh, problem, which I think has plagued a lot of PII reviews or PII identifications. You're getting a whole bunch of fa false positives. You're you're missing uh, a lot of PII, and the technology is becoming a lot more advanced with those, that regard to to correct that that problem in a really powerful way. Okay, so you know we've talked a lot today about sort of the balance of innovation yet mitigating risk and how leaders are dealing with that um, while trying to still obviously grow companies um, and ultimately how all of that influences new processes or technology. So Jen, um, the legal departments and outside counsel are often seen as dream killers. So how do you work with legal departments to be dream enablers and not dream killers? <laughs> Uh, yes, we want to help you innovate. Um, look, an organization getting a memo telling you about all the potential laws that might be at play and telling you it's a gray area, so good luck, um, does not help anyone and is a waste of time and money, right? So you're going to want to try to... Um, you know, focus on what you can do, understand where you have risks, and then try to mitigate those risks, right? And how do we mitigate risks? We do it through contracts, we do it through insurance, and we do it through operations. So um, if, if our tool is going to create a risk um, and we can't you know, receive insurance protections and, um, and we can't receive um, contractual assurances, then operationally, what can we do? Um, and, and that's where you know, the real kind of fun, if you will, and innovation can kind of um, come into play when we're thinking about some of those controls. Um, and, and I put on our, my LinkedIn, and I think it's available on this site too, some, some articles and blog, blog articles that um, we've done about some of these topics, but you continue to be excited about it and learn about it. Um, I just took an MIT AI certification during COVID. I teach master students who are data scientists at the university level, um, you know, getting excited about it um, and seeing the, the possibilities of technology, I think is what makes you a dream enabler instead of a dream killer. Um, but you have to understand the technologies. You know, you're, you have to be able to understand where that data travels and, and what it does. Um, and, and everyone has really kind of hit on that point today because it is such an important aspect. Um, and look, whether it's in-house counsel or outside counsel, are, we want to make it easy and simple because if it's simple and easy to understand internally with, for the program we're establishing, then it's probably easier for everybody to comply. And we definitely want to try to aim for compliance, right? So um, working with IT, legal, security teams, customer service, you know, again, having that right team from the get-go um, is really invaluable and hopefully will prevent a dream killer situation. <laughs> <laughs> so Kimberly, what are your thoughts on how in-house legal privacy compliance teams can be those dream enablers and take proactive steps to, to sort of overcome some of the challenges. Yeah, so at Inherits of Bush, we have 10 overarching principles. And the first one is we dream big. So I cannot be a dream killer. It would be against <laughs> the first principle out the gate. Um, so as in-house counsel, I think to Jennifer's point, you know, being open to you know the technology and i embrace it and um being also understanding your business and what their intent is and where we are and why they mm -hmm. want to do it and i'm always trying to be on their town halls i really want to see where they're going where they're thinking because just know your business teams are planning far and ahead so to the extent that you're waiting for what's happening next week this month like you're behind they have a five-year plan they have goals i mean things the legislation will change or regulations may change, but that's good to know where they're trying to go. So you can be upfront about the challenges that they may express so that they know as they're spending big dollar on things, look, look, the world's gonna look different January 1, 2023. So what are we trying to do now? Just so we make an investment that makes sense. We understand that, hey, this may not be able to happen, you know, in two years, are we okay with that? So helping them make really good business decisions based on the legal landscape. 
um, is really helpful. And so, and also just thinking through the things that's that's happening in the industries that we're in, right? So what if what does it look like if we're in a cookless world, right? If we're not using cookies anymore, that we're, they're still want to have these experiences. So what is that technology? Can you get in front of it? Can you do some research? Can you actually bring tools to your teams, right? And, you know, even without them prompting, as you think about the stuff that they want to do, um, and how you can be a real partner to help them continue to reach their own goals. Well, we don't want you to break rule number one, Kimberly. Um, Mia, <laughs> yeah, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I think a lot has already been said, but really, you know, top of mind with this question is just being a strategic partner. I think, you know, uh, with being a strategic partner, it's coming to the table with potential solutions, workarounds, ideas as you're working side by side with the team and definitely to a lot of what's already been said, you know, having the team really explain what it is that they're trying to do. Um, be willing to say, pause, can you, you know, can we get some background here and have them literally walk you through beginning to end, especially around data and where it's flowing and what's coming in, what's going out, what are third party relationships that exist. And then, you know, you go and you can look at the contracts underlining it. But the, the reality is, it's just really walking hand in hand towards a solution with the team and then making it clear that that's your ultimate goal to get to that solution with them. And, and Eric, I just wanted to add one more thing sure. um, that based on what Nia said, um, it's also this, um, really helping your senior leadership be privacy aware and really being feeling empowered. So as wh while I try to be flexible and, you know, an enabler, I have a lot of comfort in knowing that if something's not right, if we can't do it, that I can say that no matter how much somebody wanted to do it or what the plan was. And I think, you know, part of that is helping them be privacy aware, um, making them aware of what's going on, and then making sure that your team is empowered, that you are shank sanctioned, that leadership is not happy with, it will not condone doing things against legal. So that's also about positioning yourself, um, and then also you know work for the right type of companies. But if you're not at that type of company, you might want to consider it. But it's it's something really important about making sure that your senior leadership is evolved and that you have you know the kind of authority that you need to make sure that the company is able to live up to its obligations. Okay, thanks for adding that, Kimberly. Eric, any thoughts from your perspective of being a, a third-party service provider and how you might uh, help your clients? Yeah, yeah, I, I think technology is helping to, to augment and make processes stronger and to provide more transparency and insight into where data is, where it's going, what exists, and to quantify how much of it exists. To do that not only in your structured data, but now to make really big progress on the unstructured side as well. And I think for a long time, it was sort of a wild west where companies didn't know in really quantifiable ways where the data was, how much existed. Um, and now with that insight, I, I hope, I think that technology is becoming uh, a dream enabler and is allowing uh, the privacy departments and, and the product teams to, to really advance the ball in that respect. Okay. So we're gonna end with a little round robin here. So uh, each of you, Around 30 seconds, what is your parting advice to the audience on the topic of privacy and, and artificial or augmented intelligence? Uh, Kimberly, you want to start? Sure. Uh, so last thoughts is as legal and compliance professionals to really enjoy this moment. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. We're earning every dollar um, for all the stuff that's going on. So one, enjoy this process. This is what we do. We love solving problems. And um, the more complex, hopefully, the more we enjoy helping our business teams figure it out. Um, I think the other thing is, again, to continue to know your business, be in front of what their desires are, what their goals are, what their dreams are, so that you can actively support that. And then follow people in the industry, because it's so much that not one person can follow it. So make sure that you have a really good approach about staying on top of things. And even that's like your own personal network of privacy professionals that you can pick up the phone and call easily, your outside counsel that, are, that really understands your business, too, who can answer you pretty quickly. Um, and so I would recommend that as well. Thanks. Okay. Eric? Yeah, you know, I, I think I've seen a lot of companies where the pendulum is swinging and they're going from taking a reactive approach to a proactive approach. And I think that the thing that I would say to those organizations is data that's been defensively disposed of is not a risk to the company. So if you're thinking about this, 
you know, are these projects com complex? Yeah, they are. Are they challenging? Absolutely. But the downstream stream benefits are really enormous. And the technology is making proactive, you know, sensitive data, personal data management a very achievable goal. Okay. Nia? So I, I kind of would think of the four Bs, and that's BE. Um, first, be aware. Be aware of the data that you have within your organization. Have line of sight to it. You know, secondly, be collaborative. Be willing to work with the other subject matter experts within your organization that we talked about, privacy, um, security, technology. In addition to that, number three would be be willing to learn and ask tough questions. You know, ask your business teams, why do you need this data? What are you doing with the, the data? What's the data flow of it? Ask questions about, is there any impact around the data use, especially as it relates to bias? And then finally, the fourth one is be open. Be open to learn more about the product or what's happening with your business team, but also be open to learn more about privacy, AI, and the ever-changing landscape. I like the four Bs. Okay, like Jen, you're taking us home. All right. Um, I, I mean, I echo what everyone said. And then I think you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, this has already been done. There's people that are in the space that know it very, very well and have been doing it for a long time. And I say this because I think we had joked in preparing for this seminar, and I usually mention on most seminars because I know people do it and they do it all the time. Um, they go online and they see somebody else's policy that they like and they copy and paste it and they substitute their name for their company's name, right? Um, and you just take that policy as your own. Um, there's a lot of risk in doing that. So be very careful. Um, you know, just go, go to people that, that know what they're doing, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel and, and don't try to copy and paste it offline. <laughs> okay, that's that's good advice. Um, thank you to our panel and for everyone that joined today. Uh, there were some questions we didn't get to. I will circle up with the panelists and provide answers. Thank you, Kimberly, Nia, Jen, and Eric, and we hope everyone has a good day. Thank, thank you. you. This is great. Bye. Bye, everyone.